I got my two different models. Hopefully I'm going to bring my third, my fourth model. We're going to get them all in here and get everything aligned to each other. And with them all aligned here, there's a couple things I could do. I could do a perspective rendering. I could render these things. It may be the very first time you actually are able to get all these models from different formats together to render them. Or another very common thing people like to do in these sorts of views is they'll go through and do clash detection. And clash detection is all around about this notion that you have the architectural model, someone else had the structural, maybe the MEPs in here too. You really want to try and figure out really what is conflicting with each other, what isn't conflicting with each other. There's a whole tool for doing that called Clash Detective. And we showed this a little bit when we were talking about integrating models, where you can say that I would like to go ahead and sort of intersect the architectural model with a structural model. You could do the entire model, or you can do subsets of it. Let me even just do sort of a piece of it. I'll do things at level one in the architectural model versus things at level one in the structural model. The deal is, as you go through an intersect, especially the first time, a few times you do this, you could come up with thousands of different things that are actually on top of each other because they belong on top of each other. And so just sort of saying intersect the entire model against the entire other model really is too gross. It'll give you too many things that are potentially errors, and it'll take you a long time to sort through it. So Better if you can kind of uh, sort things out a little bit better. Okay, Between those two, it found 128 things that it thinks are conflicts, based on a hard conflict. That's things where they're actually intersecting each other. So if I go over to results, and I start taking a look at any of these things, it'll start showing me where different things are that it thinks are intersecting with each other. And let me uh, say hide the other things. This looks like things are intersecting with a slab. In fact, I can sort of see that right here. Is slab is intersecting. Oh, this is slabs intersecting with the footings. Actually, a lot of you noted that as you were going through and like uh, taking care of things. Now, that's something where you may decide that's actually A-OK, -okay, so we don't really care to go through and change that. Let's go pop it on down a little further. Here we have some round columns, the architectural columns, intersecting with the uh, structural columns. Uh, what's this one? This is, looks like it's a W10 by 49 with an interior partition wall. Okay, And that is an example of, that's what I'd call actually a fair conflict. That actually is something that in the field, what will tend to happen is we'll build the car partition wall right after the column. You know, We typically wouldn't go through and model it in the level of detail that says every last section needs to be sort of sorted out there. Okay. Yes? Yes, exactly. Okay. So what I want to be able to do for any of these different sort of clashes is go through and select it. I can add a comment to it. For example, I can say that, oh, this is OK, and say that it's approved or resolved. If this is just something that I don't really care about, it's something that I looked at, and although it's conflicting, it's something that I'm going to allow, I can go ahead and say that that's an, an approved conflict, and then it'll stop showing up on the list and stop bothering me. OK, so this is OK modeling simplification. Okay, and that way we won't worry about it so much. Let's pop it down here. So we'll keep on getting other ones, and we can sort of start moving our way through the list. That's, that's clash detected, but that's a whole other uh, class. So we'll leave that one away. What we're really going to focus on today is the whole notion of how we can do the task timelining. So let's talk about that. Here's the deal. I got all my different elements together. Let me go ahead and close that on up. I'll roll back on out. And I got my model here. I'll bring up that selection tree again. And here's what I'm after. I would love to go through and be able to kind of take all the different elements in this model and map them to different tasks. And let's think about what a task timeline might look like so we have a target in mind as we do this. I'm going to bring up an Excel file, kind of a very simple little task timeline here that really just has a bunch of different tasks. I have some IDs, I have some names of the tasks, some durations, some expected starts and expected ends. So if you do scheduling at all, there's a lot of ways you can do scheduling, but it all sort of ends up looking something like this, where you have different activities that we can map to different items in the model. 
We have durations for them. And based on the durations, the start and the end dates, and some sequencing, we'll sort of figure out if we start in 1226 that we're going to end sometime in May. Okay, so, and for constructing this, you could construct that in Microsoft Project. If that's your favorite tool, you could construct that in Primavera. I did this one just in Excel, and we're going to kind of send out actually the same Excel spreadsheet I use. You know, just it's really just kind of some pretty simple data arithmetic to sort of figure out how to sequence these things together. But use whatever tool you want to in terms of doing this. Because in the end, even this Excel file just comes out as a, what's called a comma-separated value file. Let me see if I can find that for you. Uh, where did it go? There it is. It looks something like that ultimately. It's just really the values, commas, and the data values in there. So you know, out of your tool, you ultimately come up with a comma separated value file if you're doing it out of Excel. But if you do it out of Microsoft Project or Primavera, it can read those file formats directly. And that's kind of OK. So we take that information, we save it away as a CSV. Save it as, if we want to get in. And instead of the workbook format, I'll say, oh, where is my CSV? There it is, for MS-DOS. OK, and I can go ahead and save that away. OK, but we built ultimately need that task timeline. And we're going to use these sort of distinctions to go through and map our different uh, model elements to different tasks. Now, this is one way to construct it. This is sort of a very simple model of the project that has, oh, what is it, like 15 different items. There's the first because of the titling and kind of the pre-construction activities. It's about 15 different tasks. For the purpose of your assignment, we asked you to, oh, what was it? I said 20 to 30 tasks, something like that. Okay, You want it kind of at this level. You don't need an incredibly detailed model that breaks it down. But things as simple as the first floor foundations, the first floor columns, the first floor beams, the first floor joists. There's kind of an order to it. If you could picture this building being built, we would put the foundations, and we put some columns on them, and we put some beams. And before we could put the joists in place, the beams have to be there. Then we could put the floor on it. There's kind of a very simple order of operations that at a really high level looks something like this. Now, we could get much, much finer, but you don't need to at the first level. Like, this is enough to kind of get us going. If I refine this further, hopefully I could sort of compress and be a little more refined about the overall durations. But this is enough to get you started. So what we got is now a model that has a bunch of elements in it. I have a task timeline over here, which seems to sort of try to sequence a bunch of different elements based on where they are in the project. I got to get those two things together. OK, because if I get the model and the task timeline together, then I can create a 4D simulation. So let's return our attention back over to Navisworks and think about how to make that happen. So here's the deal. I got my model. It's all registered together. Things are hopefully in pretty good shape. It all comes down to the issue of selecting things. Because, well, let me even kind of show you. Let's bring in the task timeline, and we'll really get it down to the issue of just selecting things. That's where the, the rub is going to be. So, the timelining tool shows up under tools. It's called Timeliner. It looks something like this. Okay. Right now, there are no tasks defined in here. I could define my tasks here if I wanted to. I could say add a task by right clicking down in this area and add a task. Okay. And I could sort of put in a start and an end date and give it a name and all that kind of good stuff. But I don't like to do it that way. I like to actually bring it in from one of the other tools. So I'm going to delete that one. I'm going to go to the linking tab. That'll let me point to an external file and bring the data in. So if I go to link and I say add a link, I have the choice of bringing in a Microsoft Project file, a Primavera file, or a CSV file. I'll choose CSV. Then I'll go out and grab my little task timeline. Now if you bring in a CSV file, since your CSV can really be almost any Excel file, we need to give the program just a little bit of help about understanding how the information in your columns maps into what it expects in its columns. So it's going to grab the information up here, task ID, type, title, duration, and the column names that you used. And you're going to map it into sort of its versions of what those things should be. So let's switch back over to Navisworks and show you what I mean. Okay. It's turned on right now with row one contains the headings. Okay, if that was turned off, 
Instead, it would just be column A, column B, column C, but I'll say the first row actually contains some headings. And then for each of the different items, we can just sort of say what the mapping is. The task name, I called title. Task ID, I actually have something called task ID without the space. Type, type is the issue. Is it a construction activity or a demolition activity or a temporary activity? I don't have a unique ID. I have a start date, which maps to my column expected start. And I have an end date, which maps to my column expected end. But all that really is is just mapping things apart. And you could even add in some more fields. There's like 10 user-defined fields. You could really bring in whatever's going to help you manage the data as you go through and try and sequence it. So that's enough to get ourselves started. Let me say OK to that. You'll see now it is pointing to that CSV file sitting out there on the L drive. That's kind of OK. It still hasn't actually created the tasks yet. That You'll see the tasks are still blank. OK, the link is there, but it says that its status is old. What we need to do is just sort of refresh that link and rebuild the tasks out of the link. And to do that, we could right click on it again. And we could either rebuild the tasks from the link, or we can synchronize the tasks from the link. So let's talk about that. If I rebuild the tasks from the link, what it's going to do is go through and look at the linked file. And all the tasks, it'll go through and create new tasks based on what it finds there. So if you have new tasks in there, you've added tasks, do a rebuild, because that'll pick up all your new tasks. If, on the other hand, you just have the same list of tasks and you change some of the values, like you change the start or end date or something like that, don't rebuild, just do a synchronize. Okay. Either way, it kind of gets you to the same place, but synchronize is a little softer, gentler. It won't recreate the entire list. It'll just go through and change the, uh, the, the information on the different tasks. But to start with, let's do a rebuild. Okay, doesn't look like it did very much, but it says it's synchronized now. And if we go over to tasks, you'll see that it's just pulled that information in there. So it's pulled in level one floor slab just out of the file. It's active. It has the start and end date. We're pretty much ready to go. We scroll on down the list. You'll see that it goes all the way down to all stairs, and that finishes up around, well, I guess the roof comes in around 510. It finishes up in the end of May. Now, this is all looking kind of OK in terms of what's going on right now. I kind of push some of those over a little bit. I'm not going to make any distinction between planned and actual right now. They're all construction activities. But there is a very important field you want to know about over here called attached. And what is attached used for? That's where you actually do the mapping between the model elements and the different activities. Okay, so let's think about what you can do. Attached is really, that's the key to making this all work. And if for the first floor slabs and foundations, you click over here, I can go through and actually attach items to it. So let's think about that. I could go through and up here in the model, select some items and attach the items to that task. Okay. That's kind of OK. That's a starting point. So I could come up here and say that, you know, I'm going to level one. I'm going to go through and choose some different items over here. OK, and I can come down over here and say, let's attach those items. Select attached items. Attach selection. Jeez, other way. <laughs> OK, and that'll bring those in there. Now, that's kind of OK. It's a little bit well, opaque about what's happening right now, because I can't really see which items are there. Unless, of course, I go away and I say, select the attached items and kind of get it back that way. Okay, But I tend not to like to do it that way. That way, sort of like a, oh, yeah, I don't like doing it that way. It just seems a, it's a little too opaque for me in terms of what's going on. Okay, so what I like to do is actually, and what most people will advise you to do is create selection sets based on the different items in the model and attach those selection sets. Okay, so let's show you how that looks like. So as opposed to physically picking one, two, three and attaching those items, let's do it as a bunch of sets. And to do that, what I'm going to do is, oh, I'll just pop back over here. Let me close up the timeline and winter so we're not looking at it right now. And we'll talk about some selection sets. I'm going to open up the selection sets window, and we'll create some. So here's how selection sets work. There's a couple ways you can create selection sets. The first way is you can go through and physically just select a bunch of items and give them a name. 
So for example, if I wanted to get all those foundations, I could scroll on down in the list and find them. There they are. Shift click to get them all. I could even uh, hide the ones that I'm not selected right now. And after I've selected those items, if I right click in selection sets, I say add the current selection. Okay, I'll call those the uh, first floor footings. The nice thing about having those is that once I have that selection set, you know, it's easy to go ahead and grab that selection again. I don't have to go through and grab them again. It's just really saving all those different pieces in the columns. Come back over here. Now, that kind of works out okay. I could come over here and grab some columns too. And I can hide the under ones if I want to see that. Okay, there's the first four columns and I can say, Add a current selection. And I'm going to call that the first floor columns. And that's kind of working OK. And I'll go back and unhide those again. Which I'm doing the wrong way. Let's do it this way. OK, turn those off. So I can go through and keep on defining these things. The deal is, this is going to work really well for some items, but pretty soon we're going to start getting to different items that are kind of hard to select. Actually, there's two problems with this method. Let's talk about both of them. The first is, this is a static method. If I go through and select things and give them a name like this, that's not dynamic. That's actually these 32 items that I just selected are part of the selection set. The problem being that if you update the model and you add a few more, they won't automatically be in there because it's really just the static set. So that's not very good because if my model is likely to keep on changing, someone's going to spend their whole career just going through and trying to make sure that everything that's in the model get made it into the selection sets. And it's really easy to make a mistake when you do that. So I tend not to like to do it as this manual selection method because I think it's just, you know, it's sort of it's asking for trouble. Okay. So what you can do, though, is, well, you know, these all have names that are pretty similar. Maybe I can be smart about this. Maybe I could say just grab everything that says 72 inches as a sort of criteria and then call that a selection. Okay, and what that would look like is like this. We could say, oh, let me go to the find items. I have it open down here. If you don't have it open, you could like uh, say find items and bring open that window. I'll bring that window open. I can say within here, and now I can start choosing different things. That worries me a little bit. What I'm going to do is say that I want to go for the elements. And if you're really good at using this, I can say, oh, well, the, the type, which is what that field is considered, contains. And then it contains, and here are a bunch of different values that are in there. But if I want to get everything that contains even 72 in there, or 72 inches, I can put that together. Say find all. OK, it's going to grab them all for me. And that's another way to do it. If I want to save this, I can say add the current search. And let me uh, close that up so you can actually see. There it is. Okay. Now, what's the difference? The difference between this one, which is static, and this one, which is dynamic, is that if I add some more things that say 72 inches, they're going to get added in there kind of very nicely for you. It'll sort of update. So searching is almost always better than selecting. Okay. But you still have the whole issue of making sure that your search criteria is right. And what's going to happen, you're going to find out pretty quickly, is that it's kind of hard to define search criteria. Some things are pretty easy. Like it was pretty easy for me to go through and spot those things and find something they have in common. You know, as I'm going through and I'm trying to find all the columns, okay, that's going to be the 10 by 49s. That's probably not going to be too hard to find either. But really quickly as you're going through, it gets to be hard to figure out which parameters and which values to go through and select things because the way it presents it is just not necessarily the most intuitive about what's going on. So if I want to, for example, get all those joist elements, they're kind of hanging around over here, but 
It's the 12 K5s. Maybe there's some 12 K3s in there. It's kind of hard to figure all that stuff out. So what I like to do is really, I need to do the searching. I need to do this thing, but I don't like to define my criteria over here so much, only because the way it organizes the data and the way I think about the data are different. Okay, you can go through. You could actually find out there's an incredible data structure behind this. All the data got transferred, and you can go to properties and see what it is. But for all the different elements, you can find all these different things, and there's a bazillion different fields in there. You can select them based on oh, the actual values of the structural fittings, or the, the values of the structural things that are, uh, have been computed. You could find everything that has, you know, every sink that has the material porcelain ivory. And if I Uh, I'll say cancel that. Oh, it's because of uh, what's going on over here. Let's go for something a little bit different. At different elevations, different categories. Yeah, you can basically select anything you want in here in terms of the beams. There's all the different bean names. That'll actually go through and get them all, and I can try that. Okay, that'll get them all. But it's a little tricky to go through and find the criteria and figure out the ones that you want there. If you found them, it's easy enough. You can just go ahead and double click on it and then say find items. And it'll show you what the criteria is. Then I can go through and add that. So I can say add a comment or add a current search. And this will be now, this is the Joyce, but all three floors. And then I have to go through and go th uh, find some way of going through and uh, changing that so that it's only the ones on the individual floors I want. So let's pause right there, because that's the basic idea. We want to be able to kind of associate these things with different search sets. I'm going to leave you hanging with a cliffhanger that says, like, oh, but this looks like so much work, and I'm going to spend hours trying to do this. That's going to be a total pain. He can't want me to do that. So go ahead and jump up, take your five minute break, and come on back. And when you do, like an all good drama, we will present you with the answer to your problem after you've had five minutes to dwell on how bad your situation is. <laughs> so uh, go ahead, come on back in five, and we'll show you that the problem is not nearly as dire as you think. The preview of the coming attraction is there's an easy way to control that. We just need to set up another variable.